Hello, my name is Will and welcome back to another how-to guide. Today I'm going to walk you through how you can code in any language inside of Kestria by using a few lines of YAML. Now, to kind of give you a bit of the foundations, Kestra has dedicated plugins for a number of programming languages. Now, these provide a few extra benefits such as being able to uh, access inputs and outputs from these languages quite easily. They give you an environment with the language pre-installed and ready to go. And there's a few extra properties that allow you to set up some commands before your code runs, such as installing certain libraries and so on. Now, while this is really handy, you do not need this to be able to run programming languages inside of Kestra. Because one of those programming language plugins is a shell task, because it gives you a shell environment, using a Docker task runner, you can run it in a Docker container, specify an image that has all the pre-installed stuff for the language, such as the language itself, any tools that you need to build the language. You can then bundle that all together and now you've got yourself a full Unix environment with the tools you need on the programming language. And now you can just provide a few commands like you would on your own machine to run your code. So I'm gonna walk you through a bunch of different examples on how that works and give you a few use cases. Now, jumping into Kestra, I've got this very simple example here that is going to run our code using the Python script plugin. Now, this is really easy because this allows us to run our code inside of the workflow. So all I've had to do here is get this Python file and I can just paste it straight in here under the script property. So really, really handy if you wanna be able to write just a couple of lines of code, nothing crazy, but you wanna be able to tap into the full extent of a programming language rather than having to use one of the plugins and maybe chain them together. If you'd rather just write it here, then you can do that like so. Now, as you can see here, we're using the pandas library. So using the before commands property, I'm able to install pandas so it's ready to go in an environment. I could also use this to maybe install like a requirements.txt if I had one of those available and therefore it works. And so now if I press execute, we'll see that this is going to process as we would expect. And it's gonna give us the total revenue, which we can see is at the bottom once it's installed uh, pandas. And as you can see, it is actually running this inside of a container using the Docker task runner. And we can see there it has successfully given us the total revenue as we would expect. So really easy. But there is another way you can do this, which is better suited for more complex projects with multiple files. And that way is using the Python commands task. So in our next example here, I'm now using the Python commands task. Now the key difference here is this is now gonna run some commands effectively in a terminal for Python. So this is how we would typically run Python on our own machine. Now, if we go to our namespace files here on the left, I have a file I've created here called example.py, and this has the same code that we used in the other task. Now, because this is here in our namespace, I can now access this in the commands task, but to do so, I do need to add this additional property called namespace files and enable it to true. This means now this task will be able to see all of those namespace files. So if you have maybe a requirements.txt, it can see that too. You can also use an includes and excludes property inside of here too, if you'd rather only certain files can be accessed by this task in case maybe you end up you know, removing stuff by mistake. As you'll see that when I execute this, this is gonna run no problem at all, just like we would expect. So really, really, handy again for it still pandas again inside of our container and we can see that once it has done so it does then run the code so this is much more suited for those examples where you've got maybe multiple files that talk to each other maybe they're in version control this does a much better job of being able to enable that sort of workflow rather than having to paste it directly into your uh, yaml code i mentioned this is running in a docker task runner which means it's running inside of a container now by default it runs in a docker task runner so you don't have to specify anything, but we can actually specify the task runner property if we want to and change the type. And this is where we can specify either the process type to run as a sub process on the Kestrel machine or inside of a container. Now the container one is by default, so I'm gonna leave that. But because it's in a container, we can also specify the container image it's gonna use. So here it's just auto filled me this Kestra Python one, but I can actually change a different one called PyData, and this comes with pandas pre-installed. So now I can get rid of the before commands, and I now have an environment that is perfectly ready for my uh, Python code. And again, this works with any other Python image that you might use in a container. So you can really 
make this work just for you. So here I can execute this like we would expect. We can see that it runs it like you would expect it to, and it then gives us the same result, but it's using that image that already has it pre-installed rather than having to install it using pip. And I'm, you know, like I said, because the task runner is a default value, I don't have to specify it. It will still work with just container image. So really handy if you wanna be able to just specify different container images for different tasks without having to add that it's working in Docker. Now, one of the cool things about being able to write your workflows in Kestra is just because you don't have to just execute your code. In fact, you can make the workflow interact with your code. So in this example here, we're back with a script task, but we've got an input here. And this input has that data set URL that we were using with pandas. But instead of having it in the Python code, we can then use an expression here to be able to paste it directly in our execution. So this means we can change in and out that data set every time we run this, which means maybe Maybe you run different data sets at different times a day, or maybe this, you know, you want to be able to test it with different ones. So you'll see here when I press execute, it does give me the default value that I already requested, but it's going to paste that into the Python code. So really, really handy if you want to be able to uh, pass a bunch of parameters in maybe as part of a function, and you can do this directly from your inputs. So really, really handy. So you can actually see that I've changed the example now to have a little function here. The function is going to get the parameter, but we can pass those parameters in when we call the function. So now when I press execute, we can see it in action. And here, when I press execute, we can see that it's gonna run it and it's gonna be able to pass that parameter into our function and get us the value. So now we have a dynamic workflow that can interact directly with our Python code. But you might be wondering, that's great and all, but I don't want to have to write everything in my YAML code, that's not very helpful. Well, don't threat because you can actually still do this with the commands by using environment variables. Let's have a look at an example of that. So here I've got the same input, but I'm using the commands task here, and I can actually specify a few environment variables, in this case, data set URL, and I can then pass the input in there. This is also useful if maybe you've got earlier tasks that are fetching data, maybe you've got an S3 download getting you your CSV data, or maybe you're doing a HTTP download, you can then pass that output down as an environment variable, and then you can access it there. Or if you wanna be able to access specifically a file inside of your task, what you can do there is um, save it as a namespace file, um, and then you can access it that way, or you can pass it in as an input file. So you can then just, uh, paste it in that way. So loads of ways to be able to hand data, whether that's files or just text into your code, and then you can then work with that. We'll look at another example of using input files shortly, but here I've got that environment variable, but I am gonna now need to update my Python code so that it can handle the environment variable. And here I've got a very simple os.mron that's going to just access that environment variable, hand it over to pandas, and then let pandas do the rest. So now I can execute this. It's going to execute it with the dedicated file using environment variables, which also means if you then wanna run this on a local machine, all you've got to do is just pass your environment variables through and it's not gonna break. Whereas the embedded directly into YAML, if you had that locally, you wouldn't be able to test it because the expression wouldn't work in the same way. But again, we can see that total revenue is what we would expect. Now I mentioned earlier that if you wanna use a programming language that doesn't have a dedicated plugin like the ones we have on the screen here, we can actually use the shell plugin to give us that environment that we need to then be able to execute any programming language of our choice. So we have pre-made plugins for Ruby, Node, R, Julia, for example, but maybe you wanna use C, for example. You've got some scripts that you wanna run in C that are really quick and just not gonna work in something else. So we can use the shell task here with the commands one to be able to hand it a bunch of commands and then we can put our C code as a namespace file. So let's have a look at that. So here I've got a simple hello world file, very simple just for this example, um, but this is all written in C. Now, because it's a namespace file, I can use the shell commands uh, task with a Docker task runner to access that, make sure that we've got the namespace files enabled. And then the key thing here is I'm specifying a container image, which in this case is GCC, to make sure that we get the um, tools we need to be able to compile the C code and then we can execute it. So here you can see in the commands, I'm using GCC to compile our C code and then I can simply then execute the file it produces. And so let's have a look at this in action. 
And as you can see here, it pulls GCC and then it's able to give us the hello world. So now with this in mind, let's take this a little bit further and recreate that same scenario with the CSV file using C. Now we're gonna do a couple of different things here to show you how flexible Kestra can be. So first things first is we're gonna download that CSV to begin with using this HTTP download task. So when we run this, it's gonna run an output and we can then pass that output down the chain. And as you can see here, I'm using that input files property to be able to then pass it the uh, file that we want it to use. So now when our container runs with C, there'll be a file already inside of it called orders.csv with the content of the output. So really useful to be able to dynamically access that value in real time. The second thing is I showed you how you could execute C code as a namespace file, but you know, you probably assumed that because we were using the commands task, there wouldn't be a way to be able to write it in line and writing it in line can be useful for being able to use expressions directly inside of your code. Well, don't threat because of the input files property, we can then specify another file, in this case, the C file we're gonna use with a pipe here, and then we can specify all of the C code directly underneath. So here you can see we've got our main function here, and this is gonna just go through that CSV file, which it can access because it's in the same container, and then it's gonna produce the output and print it to the terminal. And so we can see that in action, and we've actually got the same example here in Go, where again, we're going to pass it that CSV file as an output and then give it to it as an input file, run that same example and then print it to the terminal. So let's have a look at that in action. So here we can see it downloads that file. And then with the C code, we can see that it then gets the exact same response we were expecting and go as well for the same example. So very similar setups, but this is in completely different languages. So just shows you how maybe you'll set up your workflow one day for Python, but then you decide you wanna change your stack to something more suited to the task. Doesn't mean you have to then rewrite all of your workflow just because you changed the language. The workflow is, you know, simply just change a few commands, maybe a container image and away you go. We can actually go to the outputs tab here and see that it gets that data set, right? the data set being this, which is what we were expecting. But then we can see it goes to C and is able to use that file successfully. So what we've been doing is printing that statement to the logs, which is great and all helps us see that it's working, but it doesn't allow us to be able to then use that later down the line. Maybe we wanna be able to send that value to a different task. Maybe you wanna send it as a notification. Maybe we wanna put it in a spreadsheet, put it in a database, I don't know. but we can use this special syntax to be able to send it as an output back to our code. Now, for languages like Python and JavaScript, we do have a library that you can install and then be able to send those outputs or metrics back to so then they'll appear under the metrics or the outputs tab. But for languages that don't, uh, such as Shell, what you can do is by creating a, um, a dictionary of outputs and then a key value pair of all of those outputs, we can then send that back and Kestrel will recognize it. Not the cleanest solution in the world, but this does allow us to then get usable values that we can then use later on. For example, here we've got the two double colons. That's gonna then allow us to then put outputs, total, and then the revenue. And then that's gonna appear. Now it's no longer gonna appear in the logs. So we'll see that the logs don't say it, but if we go to outputs and then go to C, we'll see under vars, we do now have a total and that value at the end. So it's exactly like we were expecting. It's gonna give us that value, which means now if I go and create a new task quickly, so here I can actually execute this and we'll see that when it executes, it will get the data set, it's gonna run our code and we'll see the log message, which is moving so quickly I can't reach it, that it gets that value. And that value there was generated from the C. You know, we didn't make that in the log. So it shows you just how powerful you can make your workflows without having to make huge amounts of adjustments to your code. The only adjustment we've had to make directly to the code for this to work is to do this. And this also works for output files. If you save a file like you would to any system, that file will then appear in the outputs tab as a file that you can then preview or download or in the case of the downloads task up here, you can then pass it to a later task and use it. So let's say you then process the data. So you've then extracted the data, then you wanna transform it. Then you can go and load it back into wherever it needs to go. So really, really cool.
Hopefully you found that useful and you're gonna start using different programming languages directly inside of your workflows. Make sure to join us on Slack where you can discuss with us further and make sure to give us a star on GitHub.